pastors uh, and leaders uh, in, the, in the Christian community uh, that have had moral failure, uh, just gone on power trips, made some really bad decisions. And, and I wrestle with that, and I, you know, I'm thinking to myself, like, I got their materials, I use their videos, and do I just trash them all? You know, really, I go through my head in that. And, and then I, you know, I've been learning a lot in this series. Because I look at that, and, and like just, just getting ready this week, I was thinking on uh, King David again. And just thinking, like, well, what do we do? We trash King David? You, you see where I'm going here. I, so I'm, I'm, I'm learning a lot as we do this series and reflecting on individuals. You know, we've, David is, is as someone who did great things for God and yet uh, faced incredible moral failure. Uh, but one of the things that we've seen is, you know, the Scriptures don't lay out people as being perfect. We have a perfect Savior. Uh, and really, David, David was... He, he was a man that described after God's own heart, uh, but he struggled and he fell. He needed a God of grace and mercy. Uh, you know, and then we've got the wolves in sheep's clothing. There's no shortage of them. They're out there. Uh, you know, the, the, the people that uh, they're morally bad with deep within. The problem is the world is not able to distinguish between godly leaders who fail and wolves in sheep's clothing. But most important in this whole series, as I've always mentioned, is we, we're going to be talking about a king again today, but we go back to the king of kings, because he's the one where our focus is to be, and he is the one that is all that none of us could be. But as I've been thinking and getting ready, and, we're, and as we go into this morning, so far what I've seen is, in the kings that we've seen, we've got uh, a few doors here. So door number one is King David. David became the standard for all the good kings, uh, certainly not his immorality, but the standard of, he was described as a man after God's own heart. He's a, he's a picture, a fallen picture of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So David was a man who wanted with all of his heart to serve the Lord. He did have moral failures, but he was described as a man after God's own heart. He sought the Lord, and when he failed, he sought forgiveness. Now, Jeroboam... Uh, one of the kings we looked at just uh, uh, the other week uh, was a man, uh, the opposite really, he was a man after his own heart. And in many ways, he's a picture of the evil one. And what we saw, if you uh, li- heard that message or if you followed it online, is that even in a couple of the passages in Ezekiel and Isaiah, when it is describing a king, it suddenly flips to going much deeper in describing the devil and how the devil was the one really behind those kings. And so Jeroboam was a man who was really a wolf in sheep's clothing. He did nothing to draw people to God, but what he did was take everyone away to worship idols. And so this morning we're going to look at Jehu. So we're jumping ahead. We're going to be in 2 Kings. We can't do all of the kings that there were. And Jehu, what about him? How does he fit in? As you can see, he's not door number one. He's not door number two. So we're going to look at Jehu, and then we're going to ask ourselves when we come to the end, actually, where do we fit in these three here? So let's turn with me, please, to uh, 2 Kings chapter 9. We're going to come into it. What I encourage you to do is to, to go home and read we're, we're only jumping into a few verses that describe Jehu. Uh, there are a number of chapters on him, and you need to look in 2 Kings and also Chronicles. But when you go and you get the full picture, it's really, it, it fills it in a lot. So I'm just whetting your appetites. Chapter 9, verse 1 of 2 Kings. I'm reading from the New International. Page 266, if you're using a pew Bible. Uh, the prophet Elijah summoned a man from the company of the prophets and said to him, tuck your coat into your belt, take this flask of oil with you, and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you get there, look for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go to him, get him away from his companions, take him into an inner room, then take the flask and pour the oil on his head and declare, this is what the Lord says, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and run, don't delay. So the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he entered, or when he arrived, he found the army officers sitting together. I have a message for you, commander, he said. For which of us, asked Jehu. For you, commander, he replied. 
Jehu got up, went into the house, and then the prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head and declared, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anoint you king over the Lord's people, Israel. You are to destroy the house of Ahab, your master. I will avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the Lord's servants shed by Jezebel. The whole house of Ahab will perish. I will cut off from Ahab every last male in Israel, slave or free, I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. As for Jezebel, dogs will devour her on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and no one will bury her. And then he opened the door and ran. I'm glad I don't have to do that and give a message and run out before anybody can get me. Chapter 10. Just go ahead a little bit. Turn the page, chapter 10, we're skipping by quite a bit. Like I said, go home and read these. But chapter 10, verse 28. So Jehu destroyed Baal worship in Israel. However, he did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit, the worship of the golden calves at Bethel and Dan. The Lord said to Jehu, because you've done well in accomplishing what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab all I had in mind to do, your descendants will sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. Yet Jehu was not careful to keep the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, which he had caused Israel to commit. So let's just quickly, um, I'm going to draw some things out of some of the passages that we didn't read. But first, I just want us to think about Jehu's call. Jehu was called by God. It's very, very clear in the passage here. The prophet goes, and God has a message for him, and God says a number of things to him. He's anointed by God to be the king. Now remember, all of us, when it's talking about the king of Israel now, we're talking about the northern king. There has been civil war, so there is Judah in the south, and there's Israel in the north. So when he's being made king over Israel, it's over the ten tribes, not the twelve tribes. So God calls him to lead his people. God's very clear, you are to be king over my people. You're to care for their welfare. You're to be the one to protect them. All right? God commands him also, this is really important, God commands him to deal with sin. And specifically, I wish we could go into the whole history of Ahab and Jezebel and the, the depth of the depravity and the wickedness and the evil that was there. So God says, you're to care for my people and you are to deal with sin. And he's very specific. When you go into chapter 9, verse 8, he says, you are to strike the whole house of Ahab. Everyone in Ahab's household is to die. Uh, again, I can't go into uh, it just... Um, as an offense to some of our moral senses, what's going on here, that's a whole different topic in itself. God says, you are to be my sword for judgment, and you are also to bring judgment on Ahab's wicked wife, Jezebel. Now, Jehu seems to be, when you you read through this, and you look, because in the end, God says, you have done what I asked you to do. It seems that he is really zealous for God. He does as he's commanded. He In chapter 10, verse 16, when you go to chapter 10, verse 16, actually, I've got a quote up here for you. Here's Jezebel, or Jehu, sorry, and he calls to another commander. He says, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord, and he had him ride in his chariot. So Jehu seems to be a king that is very zealous for doing what God has given him to do. He actually seems to go above and beyond because I didn't see anything. Of course, we don't have everything that's written, but he seems to go above and beyond what God commanded. In He wipes out the Baal worship. And so there's quite a passage in there. It's quite brutal what happens, but he gets all of the Baal worshipers together and he wipes them all out. So in chapter 10, verse 28, Jehu destroyed the Baal worship in Israel. So, and this again is the northern tribe, not the southern, but he brings an end. All the priests, the temple, everything is all destroyed and wiped out. And so in chapter 10, verse 30, 
the Lord honors them. And he says, the Lord said to Jehu, because you've done well in accomplishing what's right in my eyes, done this to the house of Ahab as I had in mind, your descendants will sit on the, sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. And so for four generations, his family is on the throne in the northern kingdom. But when I read this, it's like my sensibilities are a bit, because you read the whole story and this guy is brutal. And I said to myself, what's going on here, God? Like, are you advocating all this junk? But then you have, what you have to do is you have to look a little closer. And that's the important thing in studying the Word of God. He's actually condemned by the Lord. God is no debtor, by the way. So Jehu did some things that God asked him to do. And so God honored his, his he rewarded him for that. But that did not absolve him of what he did wrong. And so when we look closely in Jehu's life, it's not all what it seems. Was it God's will or his? See, what's fascinating here is you'll read, in, and you can read in Isaiah, I think I've referred to this one before, God, God used the Assyrians to judge the northern kingdom form. I'm jumping a little bit ahead in history. And I think it's Isaiah chapter 10, it talks about that, where Assyria, they were God's instrument of, judges, of judgment, but God says to Assyria, but you didn't do it for me, you did it for yourself, and so when you're done, I'm going to judge you as well, because your heart was twisted and evil. And the same thing for Babylon. Well, actually... It comes down to this with Jehu too. Jehu did some things, and he did some things for God, but the question is, who was serving whom here? What was it all about? Was it God's will, or was it his will that he was carrying out? You, you get where I'm going on this one? Why did he do what he did? So the big question was, was it God's will, or was it his will? And what I've, what I've come up with here is he did for God, he did things for God, but not God's way. And not for God. It was all about himself. So you go in chapter 9, verse 27, he doesn't just deal with Ahab's house, he murders Ahaz Ahaziah, the king of Judah. Now when you read a little bit closer, what you realize is Ahaziah his wife is Athaliah, who's the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. So in other words, the king of Judah, he murders the king of Judah. But why did he murder the king of Judah? Well, the reason was is there was a blood relationship through marriage to Ahab, the king in the north. And so he gets rid of any competition. He's not just handing out judgment for God. He looks and he says, well, I better get rid of Ahaziah because he's married through, he's connected through marriage. And so he wipes out the king of Judah, which he was never told to do. Uh, he also murders all of Ahab's chief men, his friends and the priests. So chapter 10, verse 11, he goes way beyond dealing with the house of Ahab. And anyone who is a friend of Ahab, he kills him. Why are you doing that? He's the king. He's got to protect himself. See, what he's not focusing on is God said, I'll make you king. I'll reward you. He says, no, this is just like Jeroboam. I've got to protect my own turf. He murders not just Ahaziah, the king of the south, Judah, but he murders all of his relatives in chapter 10, verse 14. That's why I was wrestling him ahead and saying, wait a minute, God, you, you reward this guy, but he's a slaughterer and he's a murderer. Well, God rewarded him for what he did right, not for what he did wrong. And so, actually, you go ahead into the book of Hosea, one of the prophets, just a little bit ahead of this time, and the Lord says to Hosea, call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel. So the prophet Hosea, just a little bit later after this, brings and speaks of condemnation on Jehu, because what he did was way beyond anything that God asked him to do in his slaughtering and his murdering of people. And ultimately, Jehu, he worshipped God in name only, but nothing really to do with God personally. And so you see that in 10 verse 29. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam. So he got rid of this idol worship, but he did not get rid of, he got rid of the Baal worship, but he didn't get rid of these two calves that were in the north and the south part of the country. He didn't get rid of that. So all he was doing really was protecting his own turf, setting up his own kingdom, and all in the guise of doing things for God. And so as the scripture said, and let me remind you again, he did not obey with all his heart. Jehu was not careful to keep the law of God, 
nor to turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, which he'd caused Israel to commit. Okay? It was about him. So was it God's will or his? What was he doing? Well, what I thought of was, you know, the New Testament talks about being double-minded. That's who this man was. He was double-minded. He does things for God, but it's ultimately about what he wants. It's not God's will. It's his will. And if it happens to be God's will, well, that's convenient. So this toss-up between my will and God's will, the New Testament just makes it a little clearer for us, I think, in terminology. Such a person, James says in 1.8, is double-minded, unstable in all they do. I like the living translation of the Bible in this verse. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they're unstable in everything they do. So ultimately, Jehu is someone who's double-minded. On the one hand, yes, I'm going to do these things for God, but really behind it is his will. It's not God's will. It's what he can do to make his kingdom powerful, solid, and strong. Does that make sense? That is really important. It comes right down to it. I'll serve God if it's convenient, or I will do things for God. But when push comes to shove, and, the, and it gets rough, you're going to see the real me, and I'm going to fight and scrap for my will and my turf. Well, let's look at Christ for a minute. Because that's where we always do, we come to Christ. The exact opposite. Complete opposite. Okay, Christ is also entrusted with a kingship. He has promised a kingship. He's promised rule and authority, not just over Israel, not just over the northern and the southern kingdom, over the absolute complete universe. He's also to care for God's people. He is also to deal with sin. You remember this because that's what's very, very important. God said to Jehu, you are going to be king. You're going to care for my people, and you are going to deal with sin. Well, it became a vessel of sin instead of dealing with sin. Christ is the exact opposite, okay? Christ submits with all his heart. It is kingship, but it's kingship with a cross. A huge difference. See, when it came, to push came to shove for Jehu, it's my will, I'm going to do what works for me with Christ. No, it's kingship. But the way to the kingship is through the cross, to die for you, to die for me, to pay for our sins before he is king. He submits to the cross. Let's go to Matthew chapter 26, page 703. We see it really clearly. There's so many different passages we could go to. But Matthew 26. Verse 36 to 44. And let's not do what we're so prone to do. Do not strip Jesus of his humanity. Okay? We all say he knows what's going to happen. He's God. He's all these things. And we just go to the God side and we strip him of his humanity. Here is a man born of a virgin, without sin, but he is a man, and he is asked to pay a massive price for you and I. Is it going to be his will or God's will? You have a kingship, Jehu. Deal with that. Care for my people. Deal with sin. He fails. With Jesus, you have a kingship, but you need to deal with sin. What does Jesus choose? We know the story, but let me reread it again and remember something. He's 100% man too. We just can't reconcile this in our heads. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. Let me read that again. This is the depths of his being. How do you describe this any deeper? My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. 
Stay here and keep watch with me. You know, we strip him of his humanity, but not only that, we, we fail to appreciate, and it, it, I understand it because we're human. He actually knew what he was going to face. How many of us have gone through things and said, if I'd have known what was going to happen, I would never have gone there? Am I alone? The rest of you are lying. <laughs> Come on. Right? How many times have we faced something and, you know, and, and on the positive said, I'm glad I went through it, but if I'd have known what I was going to face, I would never have gone there. I couldn't have, I couldn't have, I wouldn't have allowed myself to do it. Fortunately, we don't. But he knows. His soul is overwhelmed. Verse 39, going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me Yet not as I will, but as you will. And then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for an hour, he asked. Peter, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And he came back again and found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. May your will be done. Where would we be if he had not done that? And we can do all our theological mental gymnastics all we want, and, and rightly so. How could... God in the flesh, sin, and all those things, but let's not take away the temptation. Boy, you want to talk about the final temptation, way beyond what happened to him at the first of his ministry. Be a king. Protect my people. Deal with sin. And the kings over and over and over and over and over fail. Jehu, another massive failure. He did for God. But ultimately, it was about his will, not God's. And Jesus Christ comes and nails it. He's going to be king, but it's through the cross. It's not his will. It's the Father's will. And because of that, our sins have been paid for. We have the freedom, as Wayne was talking about in the beginning here, to be able to enter in to be called the children of God. We're going to worship, and then I'm going to close it off with a couple of thoughts. What did that worship just do in your heart? Was that moving you to think of the King of Kings, your Savior, your Redeemer, the one who sought the Father's will, not his own? Like how we were moved maybe in those last few minutes is an indicator of what's in our hearts and what we're struggling with. Life is very complex. But I think this morning what I see, what I've seen are three general categories of where we fall. Life is, there's, there's, there's things in between and all that. I, I get that, but... I think really what, what I see here, can we pull the screen up, please? It's three, three different categories, really. Jeroboam. I've been wrestling with Jeroboam and what he did in setting up those idols. And, and, and I just happened to, and I say just happened to this morning, I was talking to the Lord and saying, it's really interesting that I'm reading through Exodus when Moses got the Ten Commandments and all of the commandments in those chapters from 20 up into the 30s and how specific God was about how he was to be approached and worshipped. And really what Jeroboam did is he didn't say let's go worship another God, but where Jeroboam did was he made God into his own image. And so my fear is for some of us here this morning, we do the same thing. We worship Jesus, but it's Jesus of our own image. If there's any mixture of 
works of what I can do to make Jesus happy with me or God happy with me, if there's anything that I got to do to add, that is not the Jesus of the cross. Because what he did was everything. And there are a lot of preachers out there that are worship, that are, are sh- wolves in sheep's clothing. And some of us are, could be deluded. I don't know. I don't know your hearts. I'm not here to judge your heart. But if there's a smattering, if you were not moved to worship Jesus in those songs, it could be, yes, you're struggling with something this morning. We don't have all of our emotions. But we, ask yourself that question. It, do, do I live for myself? And is it about what I can do to make God happy? That's really critical because that's category number one. Number two is David. You know, I've been thinking about David, a man after God's own heart, and wrestling with that and the things that he did. But and let me just say this. To be able to bask, were you able to bask in the forgiveness of God this morning because of Jesus Christ? Because that's what that's all about. That's what David was a man after God's own heart. He, he sought God with all his heart. Yes, he failed. But when he failed, he came back and he repented. Why? Because he knew that God was a God of grace. And that's what Christ is all about. The perfection of all of that. Because of what Jesus did, David was able to be forgiven. But this morning, can you, do you fit into this group that needs, number one, to be forgiving to other people because they're like David, so am I like David, but because of Christ I can forgive them, but also the other side, because of Christ I can forgive myself. Can you do that this morning? Some of us, we beat ourselves to death because of the things we do wrong, and we love Jesus, but we still beat ourselves to death, and what I'm saying is, Bask in the glory of the grace of Jesus Christ. That's actually what Wayne was, wants to point us to. And in his series, is so many of us are, we're, we're, wrestled, we're tossed around because we don't fully grasp a hold of this grace and mercy that Christ offers us. Complete forgiveness. It's there, we have it, but we don't always reflect on that. We look at our failures. That makes sense. So, so you got these two here. You got the wolf in sheep's clothing. Really, oh yeah, I'm worshiping you, God, but really I'm going to do it my own way. Sadly, there's a group there. Then they, but there's the Davids. God, I fail, but thank you that you're a merciful, gracious God. Is that you this morning? Enjoy it. Thank him for it right now. And then there's this last guy, Jehu, doing for God, but living for himself. And some of us in the room, that's us. And I thought a lot about this one. How many preachers are there? How many churches and movements in God's name have been built, but it's been more about the person than about Christ? You, th- you think that I cannot do a whole lot, but do it in my name ultimately? So I'm in search in my heart this week and saying, God, do I do for you, but it's really about me? That's very possible. That's, that's bone chilling. Yeah, I belong to him. But it's possible to live for me. Are there any of us in this room that, you know, as, as we're looking at this, you're feeling a little uncomfortable. It's the Spirit of God speaking to you and saying, ultimately, you know, when push comes to shove, it's more about you than it is about Jesus. One way or the other, we, we fit into one of these categories. Which is it? What is God saying to you? And it's not easy to know. I'm still searching my heart on that one. Do I fall into Jehu hood sometimes? I bet you I do. What about you? But it's about Christ. That's where, the, that's where it, it all comes back to. So I'm going to close. I'm going to close in prayer. If you'd like to come up for prayer, to, to be here, to, to talk with someone, or just to pray, what is God saying to you? Are you struggling in one of these areas? Christ said, it's not about my will. It's your will, Father. There's complete healing and forgiveness in the King of Kings. Don't leave here without being sure that he is your King. He is your Savior. Father, I praise you. I thank you. Worthy is the Lamb. What a song. Each of those ones that we sang, we sang, Lord. What a Savior we have. Lord, would you help us sort our hearts out? Help me to sort my heart out. It's irrelevant what people think. It's, it's just, 
Lord, what's most important is that we know we're forgiven. We know what it is to bask in the grace of Jesus Christ and not deceive ourselves. Lord, I don't want to live my life and in the end stand before you and and heavy heaven, but be ashamed of living for me. I want it to be about you, Lord. You know each of us in this room, what we struggle with. Help us now. Meet us where we are by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in the most worthy and precious name, the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless.